The U.S. off-off year elections seem to have gone off largely free of interference, but officials caution that major foreign influence campaigns can be expected in 2020. Three former Twitter employees are charged with spying for Saudi Arabia. Google boots seven adware droppers from the Play Store. Fishers are using web analytics for better hauls. And nation states are targeting unpatched confluence. And now a word from our sponsor, Observe It. The greatest threat to businesses today isn't the outsider trying to get in. It's the people you trust, the ones who already have the keys. Your employees, contractors, and privileged users. 60% of online attacks are carried out by insiders. To stop these insider threats, you need to see what users are doing before an incident occurs. Observe It enables security teams to detect risky user activity, investigate incidents in minutes, and effectively respond. With Observe It, you know the whole story. Get your free trial at observeit.com slash cyberwire. That's observe, the letter I, the letter T, dot com forward slash cyberwire. And we thank Observe It for sponsoring our show. Funding for this CyberWire podcast is made possible in part by McAfee, security built by the power of harnessing one billion threat sensors from device to cloud, intelligence that enables you to respond to your environment and insights that empower you to change it. McAfee, the device to cloud cybersecurity company. Go to McAfee.com slash insights. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Thursday, November 7th, 2019. The highly diversified and decentralized U.S. election system kept a close eye on Tuesday's off-off-year elections and has more or less declared success, as a joint announcement from several federal law enforcement and intelligence agencies asserted that election security had been unprecedented. That announcement did, however, note that attempts to influence or interfere with the 2020 elections, with Russia, China, and Iran likely to be particularly active. The concerns officials are voicing continue to focus on influence operations, as opposed to direct manipulation of vote totals or other attacks on voting machinery. CISA Director Christopher Krebs told CBS News, no one should get cocky. Speaking of Russian operators in particular, Director Krebs said, they're going to be back. They're trying to get into our heads. They're trying to hack our brains, so to speak, and ultimately have us lose faith in our process. End quote. The U.S. has opened a case against three men for what's being called by the New York Times and others spying for Saudi Arabia. In this case, the spying has been directed against individuals as opposed to state secrets. The U.S. Justice Department has charged three men, two former Twitter employees and a Saudi national who apparently acted as their controller, with acting as agents of a foreign government without notice to the attorney general and with the destruction alteration or falsification of records in a federal investigation. The government accused Ahmad Abu Amo, a U.S. citizen, with snooping into three Twitter users' accounts, Ali Azbara, a Saudi national, who, like Mr. Abu Amo, worked at Twitter, allegedly accessed more than 6,000 Twitter accounts in 2015. Their liaison with Riyadh is alleged to be Ahmed Al-Mutairi. Mr. Abu Amo is in custody, but the other two are on the wing, and thought likely to be in Saudi Arabia. The criminal complaint ties their activities to Organization No. 1, led by Foreign Official No. 1, and Royal Family Member 1, said to be the owner of the charity. The Washington Post identifies these respectively as Badr el Asakar, Misk, and Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. The Twitter accounts of interest to the alleged spies were, the Wall Street Journal reports, critical of the Saudi regime in general and the Crown Prince in particular. It seems that the two former Twitter employees may have been placed in the company for the purpose of gaining access to such accounts. Both men left Twitter in 2015. The case opens concerns, obviously, about the security of social media companies and their susceptibility to being penetrated by state-run agents. Somewhat less obviously, it raises another question. If the platforms can be penetrated to snoop on individual accounts... Might they not also be penetrated to facilitate the distribution of disinformation? The lowly email box remains a prime target for baddies, and as their sophistication grows, so too must our defenses. That's the opinion of Kevin O'Brien, 
CEO and co-founder at email security provider, Greathorn. Email is a really interesting piece of technology. It's been around for about 50 years. It is one of the technologies that we look at as being both venerable but vulnerable. You're looking at a system that was architected, again, 50 years ago, for academics to be able to exchange information on timeshare Unix systems. And it was never meant to be a system that we built to be secure or to exchange messages with strong authentication or encryption or any of the other things that you see in modern communication platforms. But its age gives it a a certain degree of ubiquity. That means that most serious business communications, wire transfers, exchanges of information about intellectual property, contracts, they occur over this platform. And although we've spent really the last 25 years trying to add on functionality to make it a secure system, it's fundamentally at odds with with what that platform was designed to be. And so it's now the case that we're in this moment when most cyber attacks start with an email in some fashion. And everything that people have put out into the world to try to supplant email, but the the message-based systems, if you're of a certain age, then you think about IRC. Uh, If you're a, a bit newer, maybe you're thinking about Slack or Teams. They're not equivalent technologies. They're attention distractors. They're real time. Email has a certain elegance to it because it allows you to not have an instantaneous exchange of information, but rather to think for a moment about what you might say. And so that's well suited to corporate communications, business communications. If we're going to secure the system, if we're going to make it something that is safe for communication, it has to also be easy because that's one of the foundational principles of email. I type in a subject line and a message and a two and I'm done. When I started Greathorn, so four years ago, the average adoption rate of things like Office 365 or G Suite, the the two most well-adopted cloud email platforms for for professional use, were 17% and 7% in the global 2000 respectively. Today, that combination has a nearly 90% adoption rate. And that's happened over the last 24 months, give or take. So there's a real change that's possible when you deal with semantic analysis and looking at all of the the related relationship information that no legacy product is capable of doing. That's what you should be thinking about if you're responsible for securing email in 2019 and 2020, is how can I go find cloud-native email security systems that are really, and not just from a marketing buzzword perspective, leveraging the evolutions in artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies to give us a better way to stop these threats. So if I'm using uh, something like G Suite or Office 365, something like that, um, isn't there a certain amount of protection going on behind the scenes from those providers themselves? There is. And both Microsoft and Google do a really good job at stopping what we describe as volumetric threat. You probably don't see a whole lot of spam. I mean, you might see some marketing email you don't want, but the the real thing that we described as spam in in the 1990s and the early 2000s, the Nigerian prince who's going to send you a million dollars and just needs your social security number and and Mm. last name, that stuff kind of doesn't get caught anymore, right? And those are examples of volumetric attacks. So you will get pretty good fundamental protection. and, And for some organizations, that's enough. But when you're talking about targeted email attacks, what the industry has, has classified as business email compromise, that is the impersonation of an executive, fraud attempts that are often polymorphic, that is they change based on the recipient and their role, those are not the kinds of things that the basic protections that are available, regardless of how they're, they're marketed, from your, your email provider are going to catch. Uh, like any other part of a security program, Those are the concerns that an enterprise will have, and they require enterprise-grade controls that have a certain degree of customization and a certain degree of uh, flexibility and the ability to articulate a response that is in line with your security posture. And one-size-fits-all basic protections from, from your email provider just aren't designed to do that, nor is that their business, right? Uh, they'll stop the volumetric stuff all day long, and that's good. But you don't need to worry about 
as your primary concern. The problem is that you might have worried about 20 years ago. It's not spam and it's not even things like data loss prevention where you're trying to keep someone from inadvertently sending a credit card out. You can do that by default in those platforms. The concern today has shifted. The, the locus of concern has shifted to advanced targeted attacks and you need advanced third-party technology if you're going to combat that. And maybe you don't worry about that if you're a 10-person or 20-person a small company because you can literally turn around and say, hey, just send me this email. But once you're at hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of employees and global, it's time to step up to an enterprise grade control set to give you that level of protection and scalability. That's Kevin O'Brien from Great Horn. Google has booted seven badly behaved apps from the Play Store, and they urge you to kick them out if you've already downloaded them onto your device. The apps are Alarm Clock, Calculator, and Free Magnifying Glass, all from iSoft LLC. Two apps produced by Lizat Mitis, the attractively named Magnifier, Magnifying Glass with Flashlight, and Super Bright Flashlight. And finally, two produced by Pump App, Magnifying Glass, and, another good name, Super Bright LED Flashlight. Give them all the heave-ho. Security firm Wandera found the Maleficent 7, And how the app worked is interesting. They're dropper apps that pull files in from outside the Google Play ecosystem, in this case from GitHub, and that therefore avoid the usual security checks that might detect them. There's other obfuscation in place as well. Wandera told Forbes that there's some good news and some bad news. The bad news is the obfuscation and the aggressive back door that opens subjects devices to further attack. The good news is that so far the payloads have been nuisance malware and that the number of downloads is relatively small, numbering in the thousands and not in the millions. Web analytics platforms have many legitimate uses, like seeing where users come from and how long they spend on various pages. We use them, and you may use them too. It's thought that somewhat more than half the world's websites use analytics. The biggest of these services is Google Analytics. Akamai has taken a look at the ways in which these tools can be used for evil. Phishing, in particular, seems able to benefit from web analytics. Implausible spray-and-pray campaigns, while still common enough, are giving way to more closely targeted and therefore more likely to succeed phishing. Much of that newfound plausibility, Akamai concludes, can be chalked up to criminal use of analytics. They use the analytics much the way legitimate users do, Quote, to improve kits and gather stats on campaign effectiveness. End quote. In short, to make their bait more attractive to the fish, they hope to reel in. Attackers are exploiting Atlassian's widely used Confluence collaboration platform, hitting a vulnerability, CVE 2019-3396, that Confluence disclosed and patched this past spring. NSA's Cybersecurity Directorate publicly warned that nation-state services were likely to attack unpatched Confluence instances, and various cybersecurity companies have since confirmed an uptick of activity against Confluence users. The warning is significant in itself, but it's also noteworthy as an example of the sort of relatively quick public disclosure NSA's Young Cybersecurity Directorate has promised. And now a word from our sponsor, ThreatConnect. Designed by analysts, but built for the entire team, ThreatConnect's intelligence-driven security operations platform is the only solution available today with intelligence, automation, analytics, and workflows in a single platform. Every day, organizations worldwide use ThreatConnect as the center of their security operations to detect, respond, remediate, and automate. With all of your knowledge in one place, enhanced by intelligence, enriched with analytics, driven by workflows, you'll dramatically improve the effectiveness of every member of the team. Want to learn more? Check out their newest book, Soar Platforms. Everything you need to know about security, orchestration, automation, and response. The book talks about intelligence-driven orchestration, decreasing time to response and remediation with Soar, and ends with a checklist for a complete Soar solution. You can download it at threatconnect.com slash cyberwire. That's threatconnect.com slash cyberwire. And we thank ThreatConnect for sponsoring our show.
And I'm pleased to be joined once again by Johannes Ulrich. He's the Dean of Research at the Sands Technology Institute, and he's also the host of the ISC Stormcast podcast. Johannes, it's always great to have you back. Um, you have been working on uh, some information about encrypted SNI in TLS 1.3 uh, and how that can be used for domain fronting. Uh, let's dig in here. What do you have to share with us today? Yeah, this actually work that was mostly done by Boa and certainly uh, uh, he's one of our uh, Internet Storm Center handlers. Uh, now, uh, he looked into how sort of that entire DNS over HTTPS and TLS uh, 1.3 ecosystem can be used for new attacks. Now, domain fronting itself is not a new attack, has been done a lot, and cloud providers have done a lot to defend against it. The way it sort of works is, simplistically speaking, I'm inside a corporate network. For example, I'm malware. I'm trying to connect to my command control server. But the infrastructure within the corporate network prevents me from connecting to it. For example, at some TLS gateway or via DNS, the host name I'm trying to reach is blocked. So what I'm doing is uh, I'm setting up my command control server to be behind a public cloud provider like Cloudflare. Then I'm going to connect to Cloudflare, pretending that I'm going to connect to a different host name, a valid host name that's not blocked. I can do that. I can do the DNS lookup. And then the tricky part here is in a TLS connection. Hmm. In a TLS connection, there are two parts that really determine which host name I'm connecting to. There's one part that's in the clear that's visible, and that's called server name indicator. The first packet of data that I'm sending to the server includes that basis, hey, I want to connect to this particular server. And this would be now in my attack, a server that's valid, that's uh, not blocked. But then as part of the encrypted part, I'm sending a host header that is pointing to the malicious website. So what cloud providers did is that if the server name indicator and the host header doesn't match, they would block it. But with the encrypted server name indicator that is available now in TLS 1.3, that first part is also encrypted. So uh, now the cloud provider has a much harder time figuring out what site I'm actually connecting to and as Boyan found out that hmm. this is still sort of one hole that you know, Cloudflare, which supports TLS 1.3, supports a uh, server name indicator, it actually uh, is uh, falling for this and it's still able to do domain fronting uh, using uh, this specific technique. Hmm. Is there a way to prevent this yet or is it uh, something that's uh, yet to be addressed? It's really a little bit of an open question here uh, how this can be addressed. Now, uh, in part, of course, it has to be addressed and can be addressed uh, at the proxy providers like Cloudflare. Uh, they have to make sure that they are able to decrypt that server name indicator, or maybe they're just not going to accept encrypted server name indicator, which, of course, uh, violates a little bit their privacy mission. Uh, they, they support this feature on purpose because it does provide some privacy. Now, in a corporate network that would be infected with malware taking advantage of this, uh, there are specific DNS records uh, that are being used in order uh, to exchange encryption keys for this feature. And uh, one thing that you could possibly do is block uh, these DNS records. Now, Boyan took a look at how popular these DNS records are. Right now, there are only a few dozens of them that appear to be in use across the internet. So really the feature isn't used officially yet at this point. Uh, interestingly, a lot of them he found in Russia, but um, not necessarily associated with particular types of sites. Mm -hmm. uh, so this this is one option right now to just block it. Uh, but you know, as the feature becomes more popular, if you are worried about privacy, uh, that may no longer be an option. And then it's really just up to uh, the cloud providers and not really clear yet uh, what they can do really to prevent that. All right. It's interesting and, and certainly one to watch. Uh, Johannes Ulrich, thanks for joining us. Thank you. And that's the CyberWire. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the CyberWire possible, especially our supporting sponsor, Observit, the leading insider threat management platform. Learn more at observit.com. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe. 
where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technology. Our amazing CyberWire team is Stefan Vaziri, Kelsey Bond, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Nick Vilecki, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Iben, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.